Deputy Noel Grealish and then Senator Mc <coughs> Gabrielle McFadden. Uh, and I want to thank the officers for coming in and painting such a bleak uh, picture and your honesty and uh, the, the, the situation within the Defence Forces. Look, we're not going to go in on the work. I'm not going to go elaborate on the work that the Defence Forces do. We all know the excellent work that they do. We're not here to talk about that. Where has it gone all wrong? Uh, I think there was an article in the Irish Times recently where uh, a former member of the Defence Forces, Jara Hurden, said that the relationship between the Department and the Defence Forces was toxic and dysfunctional. Uh, I'd like you to uh, elaborate on that. Where is it going on, uh, gone up? Where has it all gone, on, gone wrong? Who is actually in the hierarchy uh, uh, fighting for the members of the Defence Forces? Are the senior officers in the Defence Forces doing what they're supposed to be doing? Is the Department fighting strong enough for, for the members of the Defence Forces? Or is the Minister at Cabinet table? When you go back when uh, previous governments, there used to be a senior minister at the cabinet table uh, for uh, the department, of, uh, a minister for defence. Now we have a junior minister for defence at the cabinet table, and it seems to a lot of this has a lot of this is happening under that watch. And the question is, have you confidence in the minister? Have you confidence in the department, which is headed up by the secretary general, or have you confidence in the officers, the senior officers in the department? The, 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 the army, uh, are they fighting strong enough to get what the ordinary member of the Defence Forces deserve, which is fair play and fair pay? I'm dealing a lot, uh, we've done the Middle East in Galway, I meet a lot of the Defence Forces and members, and a lot of them are telling me they're trying to leave to join and guard the Shikana, which is, I think there's a lot of them are doing that, are leaving, they're trained, the, 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 they would be make excellent uh, members of the guard the Shikana. And I think it's a disgrace that that is, uh, is happening. You've talked about the air service under threat, uh, and in that loan, my colleague, uh, Deputy Chambers, raised that. Um, that provides an excellent service. I, I live in Galway. I see that helicopter two or three times a day flying uh, between Athlone and uh, University Hospital Galway, and I'm sure it has saved many a life. I have uh, visited the hospital in Roscommon, and if a person has a, a, a cardiac arrest or a serious accident, the ambulance is brought in straight away, the air ambulance, to bring that patient to uh, University Hospital Galway, and I'm sure it has, it has saved, and I think to be very serious if that uh, service is under threat. But is there the same crisis in the naval services? Is there a situation where we're going to have boats tied up in the, uh, in the docks in Gaul, or Cork or wherever, where we just don't have the officers to, to fur these boats, uh, the naval ships, and we bought new ones to set sail? Maybe you could uh, elaborate on that as well. Do, are you aware, uh, or look, and I don't want to go in, and I'm sure the members of the, the Defence Forces, like the Getting Fisk, and unfortunately some of them are, would you have the numbers as to how many members in the Defence Forces would be availing of family, family income supplement? And I think it's, it's a disgrace that that is happening. I think to be the only public sector organisation that would be in receipt of such a payment. I don't think I ever heard of a guard getting it or a civil servant getting it, but if members of the Defence Forces, and if you have the numbers, I think that is a disgrace if, if that is happening. Um, sorry, here, look. Uh, just on the strength of uh, the, the, the Defence Forces. No, sorry, there's one issue here, I think, in your opening speech that you said, RACO strongly recommends the adoption of a specific Defence Force pay review body to ensure military personnel are fairly treated. You might elaborate on that, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, maybe there's, look at, I've asked a few um, questions on the relationship between the Department, the Minister of Defence and the organisation, and I'd like to know where you see where that has, has, has all gone wrong, and that has seemed to stem from it's, it's, it's up the ladder where the problem is. It's not down at the bottom of the ladder. So the, it's, at, it's at the top of the ladder. Maybe you might elaborate where you feel where the problem is and how could it be fixed. Thanks, Deputy Greedy. Senator McFadden. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning, um, Commandant King and Commandant Q um, and Lieutenant Colonel uh, Priestley. You're very welcome. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome a fellow Athlonian. Um, I... I a lot of what I wanted to ask has already been um, spoken about or asked. Um, I feel very strongly uh, about this issue 
Uh, and I really admire your respect that you show the committee uh, and indeed the department uh, and the minister under difficult circumstances. And I think, you know, the, the um, retired um, Sergeant Major Noel O'Callaghan and his, his uh, protest or his parades have always had the theme of respect and loyalty and I think that comes out in every member of the Defence Forces no matter what they do and, and I really would like to acknowledge that. Um, I, I, for fear that it would go out of here today that um, any young person thinking of getting involved or joining the Defence Forces, that it's all bleak, I, I would love you to tell people that might hear this about the benefits of um, perhaps overseas deployment, uh, uh, of the benefits you know, of career enhancement or of the benefits uh, of full-time education and courses that can be done. That's on the positive side. Um, but some of what I would like to have asked has already been touched on, but the lack of corporate governance and, and the shortage of middle management that you, you have spoken about, can you can you tell me more about that in terms of how does that affect um, how does that affect uh, we'll say the members and and the levels of stress or the risk that they're put a, under or indeed as you have mentioned uh, the mistakes that are possible um, because you know these are very serious um, situations and we can't afford mistakes and um, also um, the implication of of low numbers. Uh, can you talk to me about that in terms of the air ambulance? Um, I fought very hard for the air ambulance when it was a pilot um, scheme to to be maintained and to be maintained in Athlone in Custom Barracks uh, and I would hate to see anything happen that and with the level of uh, difficulty that there are in with Air Corp pilots, can you talk to me about that um, you know, real danger uh, of that uh, service? Uh, the white paper I, I came in, in a, after a by-election in 2014 and I, intend, I attended the symposium, symposium in Farmley on the white paper and was full of the joys of life having heard about how it was going to talk up the Defence Forces for the next 10 years uh, and was, felt very positive coming out of my day in Farmley thinking it was going to be great. Um, I don't think it was ever intended to be a box-ticking exercise. I think it was intended with the, you know, to do the right thing. Can you tell me, has there been anything at all delivered from that white paper, um, you know, a real, a real, actual, tangible thing has any of it been delivered? Has there not been anything at all? Um, and if there was, uh, if there was three things we could do or uh, lobby for for you here today, what would those three things be? Thank Senator you, Senator McFadden, Commandant Com King. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you, Deputy Grealish. Um, so again, of course, yeah, I'll, I'll take Deputy Grealish first because he asked the questions first and then I'll go on to you, Senator. Um, the relationship between the Department of Defence and represent, re representative associations is a difficult one. There can be no doubt. I've already touched on it in the opening statement. There is an obsession with control and micromanagement in the Department of Defence, an obsession with control. And we would be of the firm opinion that the military advice is not heeded by the Department. Um, this, this makes it difficult to conduct our business in terms of the conciliation and arbitration process. And there is a, a major difficulty in terms of communication, in terms of receiving written communication, receiving replies and responses, and in terms of differences in opinion about the right to representation of our own members under Defence Force Regulation S6, which the Department on many occasions have sought to deny us as a representative association. So if we cannot represent our members under Defence Force regulation, what is the alternative? Are senior officers doing what they should be doing? We are all leaders in the Defence Forces and it's incumbent upon us and we are responsible to do the best that we can do with the resources that we have. But when you give a unit commander less than 50% of his or her resources, then it is impossible to do the job to the excellent level that you are trained to do. As a serving Defence Forces member, and I speak on behalf of my colleagues too, we are apolitical and it would not be right or proper for me to com comment on the confidence in an elected official or elected representative. I must say that. What I can say is, 
that this is an unprecedented retention crisis in the Defence Forces. And at the current turnover rate of 9%, and at the current unprecedented and unsustainable levels of induction training, the Defence Forces will not reach the authorised strength of 9,500 personnel, all ranks, until 2035. Um, again, it is extremely apparent to me that the uh, Emergency Air Medical Service is what rightly recognised as a, an excellent service and a vital service for rural Ireland and for the Midlands and for, and for the rest of the country in general. Remember, it is one crew, one EAS crew on 24 hours. We have two 24-hour crews in, in the Air Corps. The other one is the Guard Air Support Unit. They are all that we can manage. We would love to have 10 EASs and 10 Gazus. Well, we, we just don't have the resources, obviously. Um, I've, I think I've spelled out to, to each and every one of you the, the retention difficulties in the heli wing of Valdonnell of the Air Corps and the implications that that has for service delivery. It's not for me to say whether an operation is under threat or not. In terms of the naval service, 14% turnover says a lot. 5% is a crisis, according to the UK Department of Defence. And in the naval service at the moment, there are nine ships with a crew for seven. Able seamen are at 50% strength in station in the naval service. Able mechanics are at 46%. Communications operatives are at 50%. Cooks are at 70%. And the diving section, who are rightly lauded for their bravery in the operations that they conduct, are at 33% strength in station. In terms of Lieutenant Naval Service Marine Engineering Officers who are vital for the safe operation of Naval Service patrol vessels, the effective strength in April 2019 for these officers was 36%. These obviously have knock-on effects for morale, for governance, for mentoring, for supervision of the Naval Service. And it is no wonder that the turnover rate in the Naval Service is so high when they are being asked to shoulder the burden every day. In terms of how has this affected people on the ground or on the waves, as we would say, it impacts on operational capability in the areas of maintenance of, of the ships, boat cranes, armaments, etc. The stated policy of Naval Service Operations Command is two years in, two years out. Everybody relies on that. Families plan on that. Lives are built around that in the Naval Service. But personnel are finding that they have to apply now to come ashore after their two years are up. And as a limited number of reliefs are available for obvious reasons, not all are facilitated in coming ashore. So what does that say for morale? What does that say for the hope for the future and the, 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 um, the maintenance of a proper family life? <clears throat> Working time directive implementation would certainly focus the minds in the Defence Forces and the Department of Defence as to how we can safely operate our naval service per, um, operations. And remember, like the Irish Naval Service patrols an area 12 times the area of, of the country itself. You know, and we do not resource this, this service properly. Um, I want to speak about uh, family income supplement very briefly, or working family payment as is known now. And all I'll say about that is, like, while we're not the competent authority on social welfare by any manner of means, uh, and I think the Minister has reported that only 90 people are in receipt of family income supplement in the Defence Forces. Only 90. One is too many. One is too many. The loyal servants of this state should not be supplemented by social welfare. I must make that point, and I cannot make that any clearer. So please, let us not have any more talk of 90 being only a figure. And what isn't reported is the amount of personnel in the Defence Forces who could be eligible for family income supplement or working family payment. And it obviously depends on the number of dependents you have. But analysis has been done that if a person is the only earner in, in the family, and with the rate of postings away from home that military personnel have to deal with, quite often they are and can only be the only earners in the family because the spouse is looking after the, the, the children and dependents. Up to 1,700 people 
could be eligible in the Defence Forces for family income supplement or working family payment. Now, working family payment, as the Minister rightly says, is a matter between the individual and the Department of Employee Affairs and Social Protection, so I can't comment on the accuracy of the 90. What I can say is it should be zero. Um, you spoke about the uh, Defence Forces pay review body and how we would envisage that. Um, my colleague Derek Priestley here has spoken at length on this at one of our conferences and, and is an expert on it. I, I might get him to just give, him your, give, give you his perspective on it, Derek. Sure. Thank you, Deputy, for the question. Uh, and, and I think it was in the context you asked us where we've been fairly treated. And I can only give you my experience over the last five years uh, of being full time at RACO. And um, when you go into you know, national pay talks and you're left sitting in the corridor for three weeks, um, it's very hard to feel that you're being treated fairly. You know, the opportunity to put forward uh, your concerns of your members in relation to pay or allowances. Um, you know, the overwhelming numbers of the members of, of IGTU and that being in that environment were meant to be in a parallel process, but in reality, you're not. And, uh, you know, we've had experience of literally being the last people to leave the WRC and turn off the lights and still not have got a fair hearing on the first time outing. The second time for, 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 for what we call Lansdowne Road 2, uh, a decision was made on the second day to allow the representative associations, and I include the Gardaí, in that into the main room. But again, you know, without the full status of IOR mechanisms behind you, your voice is not heard. You know, as an association, we represent 1,200 people. Um, PD4 are probably, you know, 7,000. I'm not quite sure what the Gardaí is. But what isn't recognised is the uniqueness of military service and all of that, and our ability to come forward and speak. So. Our experience of national pay talks, while on the, on the face of it may appear that we got fair treatment, but the reality was very, very different. And it was certainly very different the second time out while we were allowed into the main room, but we were nobody. And we accept that, by the way. I think officers in particular are very accepting of uh, the role they play in society and, and the duties that they take on voluntarily. So. Going back to November 17, um, at one of our conferences, we had done a bit of research and we looked at how other militaries were, were, were looked at and treated. And we very much identified in the UK where they had a pay review body, a statutory body, one of eight, that existed right across the public sector, which was specific to that sector. And what was interesting about it was it was a full-time committee. It sat on an annual basis. It had access to the highest levels of government to the Ministry of Defence, uh, their general staff, and of course, all the members of the, the armed services in the UK. And on an annual basis, they engaged with all of these. They also had access to, to relevant data. And, and the big thing we're talking about today is retention. They, they very much knew where the, the, the pressure points were there in terms of recruitment versus retention. And when figures fell below a certain amount, and in this case, if, the, if, if if recruitment and retention was falling uh, or failing to such an extent that they fell below 2% of design strength. And we're talking about trained personnel, not talking about new entrants or cadets or, you know, newly inducted people. We're talking about trained personnel. If it fell below 2% in a particular area, they immediately moved to address that situation. And what they did was they made a recommendation to government to either adjust allowances up or down or, you know, t t specific to that circumstance. Now, before you think this is a, a great deal for the, the representative associations they gave what they want, all of that is done within the parameters of national pay uh, policy from government. Government, you know, it, it is controlling it at the end of the day, but they are very much aware of the uniqueness of the, the service and the, the position that happened. So we very much targeted the idea of a pay review body would be a, a way forward. Um, it, we are cognizant, as we're talking as well, like with a pending report from the, the Public Service Pay Commission. Um, as an association, we put a huge amount of effort into the first, our first submission to the first report of the Public Service Pay Commission. We were heartened to see, you know, not only the Defence Forces, but RACO and PD4 have mentioned throughout. We were heartened to see um, the Commission being directed to come back and look at uh, recruitment and retention, not only in the HSE and, and, and related areas and the Defence Forces. But we have to say it's two and a half years later 
and we're still waiting for a report to go to government. Um, you know, what would come out of it, we have no idea. I think we're all aware of the leaks that came with it. Um, if it's a case that what is reported is true, we'd be very disappointed after all that effort. So to kind of sum up all of that, absolutely we would see a pay review body. Do we feel we're being treated fairly? I would say on behalf of the membership, I don't see members feel that they're being treated fairly. And I think we can prove that with the, the statistics that, that Connor has mentioned frequently. Um, there is an opportunity to do the right thing here. Uh, we've been calling for it for two and a half years. We're not critical of the Public Service Pay Commission. I think they've you know, followed their terms of reference quite closely, but it's time for action on, on this side of the House.